Hey, so this is Tony Sweetland, and uh, Noel and I are Extension Master Gardeners of Wake County in North Carolina. And uh, we were talking before we got started here about all you, this is hydrangeas, and we titled it All You Need to Know, but there's, it, it's all you need to know to get started, because we could be talking about hydrangeas for the whole week. So uh, for those of you who maybe think, all you need to know, yeah, don't worry. <laughs> Go ahead. Oh, and I wanted to mention I've been a master gardener now for three or four years. Um, have been in North Carolina for 40 years, retired and started classes to be a master gardener the next day. So it's been an exciting journey. And I'm Noel Licton, and I've been a master gardener since 1997. And I've lived in uh, Raleigh for 50 years. I'm originally from Eastern North Carolina, Kinston. And uh have done quite a bit with the Master Gardeners. I do like public speaking. And so um, that's something that I've always enjoyed. And Tony and I have enjoyed giving this presentation once before, and we hope that you'll enjoy it today. One thing I forgot to mention, if any of you have any questions during this presentation, feel free to put them in the chat. And if it's something that we need to interrupt them for, I will interrupt them for you. But we will also be doing a question and answer session at the end. So if you want, you can hold your questions until then. You'll be able to unmute yourself or just ask the question in the chat and we'll we'll go over questions at the end. Thanks, Blake. All right, let's get started. Okay. Okay, so these are the topics that we're going to discuss. We're going to talk about when, where, and how to plant, the needs of your soil, care tips, popular types, zone matching, fertilization, how to change the bloom color, blooming times, growing in pots, uses, where and how to prune, issues, and propagation. Hydrangea tox tox. Taxonomy. The kingdom is Plantacea. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, Plantea. And the order is Cornalis. And the family is Hydrangeas. And the genus is Hydrangea. And the species is H. macrophylla, H. paniculata, H. quercifolia, H. arborensis, H. petiolois, petiolois, yes, and H. serrata. Tony? Yeah, so when to plant? Um, I love to plant anytime. So I have to, this is one I have to control myself on. Um, planting in the fall is best when the temperatures start to cool down. If we have a good spring where the temperatures stay mild and don't instantly get to our summer temperatures, then early spring is good. You want to pick the time of day that's coolest. Hydrangea tend to be sensitive to hot afternoon sun. So go for the cooler morning times or plant if you're planting in the shade, uh, maybe the, the shade's okay, but if it gets sun, you wanna stay away from that hot sun when they're first planted and most sensitive to it. And then where to plant? Um, they like a sheltered location where they get some morning sun and not the afternoon, I mean, and not the afternoon sun. So they like sun, especially to bloom well, but they don't like that hot afternoon sun and it will cause them to, wilt and scare you to death if they get the, the hard afternoon sun. Um, you do want to avoid putting directly under a tree and they, they tend to get torn up with high winds. So keep them in a sheltered area that where they're not getting a direct wind. Um, I have some at the coast and I can tell you the northeast wind will, will tear them up and um, cause them problems. But if you put them up next to a house, especially uh, as a foundation plant, where they're not getting the, you know, not on the western side of the house, but where they're getting some shelter, and um, they do really well there. How to plant. You want to make your hole two feet larger around than the root ball. But when you put the plant in the soil, you want to make sure that the depth of the hole and the height of the plant equals the height of the sides of the root ball. So you do not want to plant it too low, and you do not want to plant it too high. So basically, when you take it out of your pot, make sure that once you put it in the hole and put the dirt around it, the top of the soil that was in the pot is level with your uh, soil in the garden. Soil needs. Augment soil with a large amount of organic matter. Make sure your soil has good drainage and raise the root ball if necessary if your soil tends to hold water. And 
always make sure that you have a soil test if you've not had one in two years. And that way you'll start off with the right amendments to make sure that you have a well-grown plant. And the pH of most hydrangeas is somewhere between 6 and 6.2, which you'll find out after you get your soil tested. Um, so some care. So once you've got it in the ground, you want to make sure you water at least a, a, an inch a week during its growing season. But be careful to try to keep that irrigation off of the leaves and flowers. So don't set up a sprinkler that sprinkles them from above. Instead, either put in some drip or, or water them at the, at the roots. Add some mulch underneath to keep those roots moist. Um, in early spring and when we might get some cold winds and, and they might be tempted to start leafing out, be careful to protect them from, the, from that cold wind. So if we get a, an early cold snap like we did last year, um, you might want to cover them and also protect them from that direct sun in the summer. As I mentioned earlier, they will weep, uh, wilt and scare you if, you if they get that direct sun in the afternoon, especially. The variety. So you've, if you've been paying attention to the picture, you've seen we're trying to mix up some varieties here. And, and uh, one thing, I, a couple of things I want to point out, actually, the pictures, with the exception of when we get into diseases, these pictures are all local pictures. So they give you an idea of what they actually look like here. When you're making your selection for varieties, uh, um, I warn you to be careful about looking at um, pictures online because sometimes those stock pictures are um, not of plants growing in this area. Now, we are lucky in the Wake County area to have the Arboretum nearby, and the Arboretum, I believe, has an example of every variety mentioned here. Um, so it's a wonderful opportunity to walk around and see what they really look like in person in our area and the growing conditions that we have. Um, one, um, uh, probably the most common uh, hydrangea is commonly called the big leaf or the microphylla. It blooms from pink to blue to purple. It tends to be the one that, that most people play with to change those colors. And we'll talk about that later. Um, there are a lot of new varieties. There's been a lot of research going on here. So there's lace caps, which was a really pretty picture in the prior slide, I think. Um, Endless summer, which blooms repeatedly. And then the oak leaf. We were talking about this one, um, hydrangea carisifolia as a sacrifice that some people do. It propagates well, and you can sacrifice it because the deer love it. Um, and plant it out where the deer maybe will leave your other plants alone. Um, it's a beautiful large hydrangea that the blooms start white, and then as it ages, they turn pinkish purple. The panicle, oh, and the, well, let me mention the oak leaf, of course, called the oak leaf because it has a different leaf than, than many of the hydrangea. It does have a large, almost oak-looking leaf to it. The panicle, the paniculata, also has the white blooms. It fades more to bronze versus purple. Um, its leaves are the smaller leaves. And that's what the one the picture over here on the right is of it. It is the only one that can tolerate full sun. And if you live in the Cary area, you'll notice the town of Cary even put them out in the median of the Cary Parkway. There are masses of them in some spots growing. Um, so it really demonstrates how it can tolerate that hot, full sun. Um, the smooth, the hydrangea arborensis, um, has really large mop head blooms, <clears throat> mop head being a big ball head. The climbing, the petiolaris, has white blooms that are lace cap. Um, and then the mountain, the serrata, it blooms pink to blue to purple. And it's another one that um, there are some varieties that rebloom, which is interesting. When you're choosing your. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, what, go back to the last one real quick, Tony. Okay. The mountain one, does that do well in North in the eastern where we are in the Piedmont? Um, it can, yes. Um, okay. And actually, the next slide will address that a little bit, okay. which is because the zones. I didn't, want, I didn't want people to think by the name that it was misleading. Oh, yeah. Yeah, good point. Um, okay. Yeah, I don't know why, actually, why they call it the mountain. Maybe it's the big snowball when it's the one we think Maybe. of as a snowball. Okay. Well, um, these are the different zones that um, are different types of hydrangeas like, and the big leaf likes zone five to seven. And right now we are, I think we're still called 7.5, but I think with the way things are going with climate change, we're pretty soon going to be zone eight. So this one will still do fine. The oak leaf is zone five to nine. 
The pinnacle is three to eight. So that one's got a much larger, uh, lower point. And the smooth is three to nine. The climbing are only five to seven. So they're the ones that tend to be quite sensitive. And then the mountain zone is five to nine. So they really have a broad range of zones. Yes. Um, unless you're up in the the really uh, joining us from up north or up in the top of the mountains. Um, any of these can be grown in our area. And I think, mm -hmm. like I said, I think the Arboretum's got them all. No, you can take this one. Okay, fertilization. As I said before, you definitely want to have your soil tested so determine what your needs are so that you can add the proper amount of phosphorus and the potassium based on test results. Application frequency depends on the variety. And the big leaf likes several light applications of fertilizer in May, June, and uh, Mar March, May, and June. The oak leaf, the climbing, and the panicle like two applications, either April and June. And then the smooth and mountain likes one application in late winter or early spring. And you have to be careful about that because our weather is so finicky. You never know with that late winter or early spring if we're going to get a cold snap. So um, I guess the best thing to do is when you add that application, you want to hope that you look towards the point where you think you're just about the end of winter and going into early spring. Changing. We, uh, one thing that a lot of people like to do with hydrangeas is change the bloom colors or play around with the bloom colors. Um, the, the pH of the soil can affect it, um, and but not all... Um, of the species or all cultivars even within the species. But many of the microphylla and the serrata can be adjusted. First thing you have to do, of course, is know where your soil is at the moment. So do that soil test. Um, you can do it with the help of the master gardeners in your area. Um, and after April 1st, getting your soil tested is free through the state. So don't hesitate to do it. Um, wait until fall or spring to do any adjustment. You want to go with a, a more alkaline soil, so up above seven, if you're trying to get pink and reddish blooms, something between 5.5 and seven, you're going to get purple or a mixture, which you've some, you might have noticed that some of these pictures have mixtures of colors within the plant, um, blue and pink, and then an acid soil for the true blue. To lower the pH, um, you can add elemental sulfur which um, we used to say garden sulfur here, but elemental is uh, easier on your body. It does, it's less chance of inhaling it, so it's safer to use. Or aluminum sulfate. And then if you want to raise the pH, uh, use ground lime. Um, bloom, time. bloom time. Bloom time depends on your cultivar type and your growing zone. Most of these hydrangeas bloom early spring through early summer. And the new growth is added in early summer to bloom the following spring and summer. Some may stop blooming in the heat and will begin to bloom again in the fall. Most will not bloom in full sun, as we've discussed before, or full shade. So you want to be careful that you get that nice sun when it's cooler in the day. And then uh, you get uh, the uh, uh, evening uh lower sun. So you want to make sure that you plant your plant where it does not get that full midday sun. Um, somebody mentioned as we were getting started attempting to grow one in pots, they can be grown in pots. You just want to make sure that you match the plant to the pot well. Um, you'll need a pot that's at least 18 inches in diameter. And because they do like to stay moist, you want to use a non-porous pot, but they don't like to sit in water. So make sure um, the pot allows it to hold more moisture, but can drain well. And then there are some dwarf varieties out there which make great um, pot options, like Little Lime or the one over here in the picture is, is Tiny Tough Stuff. Um, it, it's a Serrata. Uh, Mini Penny, Little Quick Fire, which the prior picture was a little quick fire planted in the ground and then buttons and bows. So there's a lot of work going on to, to help support uh, growing them in containers. Um, you can use the, um, the blooms and the plants in a lot of different ways. They're very versatile. The big leaf, um, the mop head blooms, are we've, we've seen them for years in fresh floral arrangements, or they can also be dried. 
and used in wreaths and arrangements. The plants themselves make good foundation plants if you put them on not on the western side of the foundation um, so they don't get that hot afternoon sun. They make great hedges or they can be standalone specimen plants. You see this um, oak leaf hydrangea here on the right looks to be maybe a foundation plant or a hedge, but they the, the oak leaf is known um, or very commonly used as a bit of a hedge plant. They do lose the leaves in the wintertime, but um, they make a beautiful boundary plant. Pruning. Uh, deadhead will prolong the bloom time cycle. Leave the early fall blooms until they begin to fade on their own to discourage growth as freeze approaches. And you want to give your plant sufficient room to avoid having to prune them. And then you want to remove any dead wood. Uh, when you plant your plant, it will give you what the approximate size width will be. Therefore, you want to make sure that even the plant, because it is small in the beginning, may look kind of puny when you have so much space in between them. But when you plant your plants, you want to make sure that when they're fully grown, that they are now having enough room surrounding them. Because if you crowd your plants, um, they're not going to be able to, um, uh, I guess the best way to describe it is they're not going to have enough air circulating to keep them dry because you don't want that water sitting on the leaves. And also will give them enough air to surround them to hopefully avoid any diseases. So I, I want to uh, no, point out this the picture over on the right is a beautiful example of a macrophylla lace cap. And a mm -hmm. question which I've had now twice as a master gardener is, um, I have this hydrangea growing in my yard and it never blooms all the way. And then they show me the picture and it's a beautiful lace cap. And what they were expecting was it was going to be a mop head, but the lace cap, um, only the app outside um, petals open up and the, and the middle stays not open. It's beautiful. But if it's not what you expect, then you think there's something wrong with it. <laughs> so, mm. all right, issues. So the, the, this section I um, is the one area where I didn't just get pictures that were from um, our area. I, most of them came from the University of Florida, but um, they, the, the hydrangea do have some issues. And the good news is most of them can be avoided through good gardening practices. And this plant here has a root rot, um, which you can see the wilting on the left-hand side. Um, there, there's, um, the, probably the biggest issue which people have with hydrangea is my hydrangea is not blooming. And that can be for several reasons. Um, one, they may have pruned it inappropriately. And you'll hear people talk about, well, I don't know if it's old growth, new growth. Um, Big leaf, oak leaf, the mountain, and the climbing hydrangea bloom on old growth, which means old growth during the bloom season means it's growth that it put on last year. So if you go after your big leaf has gotten too big and you go in and you cut it back in the fall or the very early spring, then you have just cut off the branches that were going to bloom that year. So you'll end up skipping a year. The panicle and the smooth, on the other hand, they bloom on their new growth. So they're gonna not bloom as early as the other hydrangea because they've got to get that growth on, but it's gonna be the growth that it put on in the spring. So if you're not sure what you've got, um, then one way to, to maybe look for the clues is that um, if it blooms later in the spring or summer, if it doesn't start blooming until the summer, then it's probably blooming on new growth and you need to be careful not to be pruning it um, in late spring or early summer. Um, another reason that, that um, very common reason it hit us really hard this past year uh, for no blooms is the bud damage due to the weather. We basically had a, a nature prune all of our hydrangeas last year because they came out with that early growth because we had some nice mild weather and then we had a shocking freeze and it, it basically killed off the buds, the ends. Um, you can have too much fertilizer. So that en encourages the, the leaf growth, but not the blooms. If, just like most plants, you can either have too much shade or too much sun. Deer damage, they do, they don't, deer don't know when to prune. So they go in and just prune your plant whenever they're hungry. And then the age of the plant, and I included the, this is a climbing hydrangea, the Petiolaurus, 
here on the right. And I included it here on this page because um, it is one that really needs to be five or six years old before it starts blooming. Um, when it does, it's, it's very pretty, but subtle. It's not as showy as, um, as the other hydrangea, but it definitely takes its time getting to blooming. Um, there are some diseases, um, blight and mildew. The blights, um, the, you see these spots, this is a blight over here on the right. This is commonly called a gray mold. The betrite, betrite, I don't do Latin well, so I don't, I'm not going to attempt to say it. Uh, powdery mildew. You'll see yellow areas on the leaves, and they might even go purple, the white cottony fungal growth on the lower surface of the leaves. Um, leaf spot, the tan spots with reddish brown, this is the leaf spot in the picture. Um, there is one, um, the virescence actually affects the flowers, so they turn green and, and stunted. And there are several viruses or ring spots where the leaves are mottled and, and yellow spotting. The plants can even get distorted. Um, the good news is that the same practices um, help you avoid these diseases. As Noel had said earlier, be sure to give your plants plenty of space to breathe. You want the air to be able to circulate so that it that lowers the humidity around the leaves themselves. But at the same time, you want the soil to stay rather moist. So you want your practice around water needs to be good. You need to water early in the day and keep that water off the leaves. Don't be spraying the leaves as you're, as you're watering. Instead, focus on watering the soil and do that early in the day. And, and if you have any leaves that start to show some problems, powdery mildew is probably the most common, do take those leaves and you know, blooms or even the plant if the entire plant is affected and remove it and destroy it. Don't put it in your compost, put it in your yard waste and, and um, don't encourage its growth in the, within the garden. All, All right. right. Propagation, Tony, I'm gonna let you yeah. talk about this. And I'm gonna put a plug in here because um, this tray, and I, it's in the picture. Is someone trying to ask a question or need to be unmute, need to mute themselves? Yep. So this like they were trying to ask a question. I just muted them though. Okay. Okay. Um, so this tray and the tags and all here is um, a result of propagation workshop that I did at the Arboretum. If you get the opportunity to do um, the softwood stem cutting propagation workshop, uh, I strongly encourage it. Um, and you get to walk around the Arboretum and take your um, your cuttings from the Arboretum. And as I said, there's every variety of hydrangea there. So it's a great opportunity. Um, but the hydrangeas are a very fun thing to propagate. They, um, there's a lot of, the success rate is high. Um, so it's a fun, fun thing to do. Um, they're best done by leaf cutting. You want to, you do want to be careful that you're not trying to propagate a plant that's covered by patents. And there are some out there, some of them, like endless summer, I think might be. So watch that. And the best time to be doing this is early summer and late spring. You want the selected stem that's five, six inches long, but the most important part of it is it has at least two nodes. No, a node being where your leaf, the leaves come out, the leaf attachment points. Now you need two, you need one for below the ground and you need at least one for above. So think about that as you're as you're looking also for the length of the stem. You might have to get multiple nodes um, to get a five or six inch long piece. You might need to get a foot if the nodes are far apart. You wanna make sure your pruners are clean and sharp so that you're not sp spreading a disease as you're moving along. And you wanna avoid stems that might have an active bloom on the end or look diseased, or if it's, um, and by significantly variegated, I mean like the, the leaf is almost completely white and needs some chlorophyll in there to, to work. Um, you want to trim the stems to remove any stem that's below that bottom node. So that bottom node is going to be where your roots come. So you want to make sure that you've got it clean at the bottom. Don't leave any parts sticking off. And you want to take the leaves off of it. So it's going to be below the soil level um, and it is where your roots form. 
Now, some of these, especially the big leaf hydrangea has huge leaves. So you can reduce the size of the leaves that you're gonna leave above the ground by cutting each of those in half. That one, it helps give you better space within your propagation um, table, but um, it also reduces the, the um, stress on the cutting. You wanna dip that bottom node in, in rooting hormone uh, this picture here is just an example. I don't rec necessarily recommend that brand or anything. It's just the one that I found to take a picture of. Um, you want to place the stem into a, a moist and sterile soil mixture. You want that mixture to be rather light, not just our heavy clay, but a nice sterile mixture. And put at least that one node below the soil line and then one or two nodes above the soil line and just kind of secure it in there. You don't want to smash it down in. You just want to make sure that the stem has contact with the soil. And then cover it with a dome or with a piece of plastic. Um, and people get very creative about what to use. This is a, um, an actual dome for doing this kind of work, but you can, um, you can use a, a, you can just use a pot and put a plastic drink container over it. Um, anything that's gonna hold that moisture in. You want to keep it moist. You want to put it in some shade so it's not getting sun and getting hot in there. And you want to just keep it misted. It's nice to see some condensation along the top of that plastic dome. And then water it from below so the root, where the roots are going to be growing at least, um, stays nice and moist. And then as you start to see growth, you'll actually see some leaves start to form. You'll see the leaves that you cut off get nice and and firm, then you can start to remove that plastic or dome and um, increase light a little bit, but always keep it in the shade. And then as it gets, the plants actually start putting on some growth and you'll wanna move them to larger pots and then keep growing them up until they're large enough to put in the ground. And that's actually it. Um, so let's stop for questions for a second. Okay, for sure. We did have quite a few questions come in throughout the presentation. Uh, one thing Marilyn asked was why avoid planting directly under trees? Is it because of root competition? Yeah, root competition. And um, also that's going, that's not going to um, be a great air, usually a great air circulation area where you're getting that, that shade and, and, um, and also trees block the moisture, the water, the rain, the actual rain on it. So there's multiple reasons. Um, and, then, and it's also not been able to get a little bit of sun that it needs. Yes. Yeah. So we mm. reduced blooms. For sure. Okay. Marilyn also says, if you're transplanting, I can see plant in a cool time of day or in the fall or early spring. But if it's been in a pot, why does this matter? It just reduces the stress level. Um, but I mean, you're right. If the plant is, if it's uh, a hot day is tough. Uh, hydrangea are just very sensitive to the heat and the direct sun. So, um, avoid, and you'll see them in the ground, just wilt down at the end of the day. I um, mean, and you know, that's adding stress to that plant. So you always want to go for the less stress for you and the plant to avoid that yeah. hot sun. <laughs> yeah, for sure. If it's too hot, then you're going to have to be out there watering it too. <laughs> that's so. right. Might as well do yourself. Yes, some and think about that's a good point, Blake. To think about not just the day that you're planting and what that condition is, but what the conditions are going to be for the next week or two weeks as that plant's trying to um, start to adjust to its new environment and get some roots out beyond that pot. And it can mm -hmm. be hard for it to do on a hot, hot day. Sure. Okay. Camille was asking, is there a native hydrangea in in a coastal area? Hmm. I don't think any of these are native. I was doing some light Googling and it looked like uh, hydrangea arborescence is native on the East Coast. I don't know necessarily about coastal and it'll be native mm -hmm. more north of us. Um, but again, that was just light Googling. I am not an expert. <laughs> <laughs> the macrophylla does well on the coast in my personal experience. Um, yeah. Okay. That's the well, Thanks anyway. Okay, another question. <laughs> Why do you need to wait till spring or fall to adjust the pH? Well, that's just about my Stacy's. Or Melvina, did you, were you wanting to ask a question verbally? No. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So yeah, that's, that's I the recommendation, I think, to see the, um, the effects 
um, as it's growing. So the plant itself is um, growing in the spring and the summer. So um, your adjustments, the plant, they affect the plant immediately or sooner, I should say, at least um, versus if you wait to the fall. Mm. OK, uh, Melvina asked, are you familiar with the city line variety? And if so, do you know if they need additional fertilizer? City line, I am not familiar with that. I don't know. Yeah. Noel, have you heard that no, one? I've never heard of city line. Is it, uh, it sounds like a cultivar, perhaps. Yeah. OK, it's, it was, was it, I don't was know what the species is. Yeah. Was it purchased locally? Melvina, do you want to hop in here? Sorry, it is a cultivar, and I moved it from Connecticut. Oh, it gets very purple, vibrant flowers. Yeah, so it's a macrophilia. Macrophilia. Yes. yes. So what? Um, and the yeah, so cultivar names are Rio, Paris, and I can't remember what else. Yeah, so if I remember right from that chart, I'd have to go back and look. But the macrophylla um, is a three times, right? No. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So three times more. So it would you would follow this the the big leaf recommendation to do the light of application of fertilizer March, May, and June. The five point five to six. And then do three times. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. You're welcome. Okay. Great. All right. Marianne asked, "Will they grow in full shade?" They won't bloom well in full shade. Um, I don't have any that do well in full shade. No. no unfortunately, okay. they need just a little bit of sun. Morning sun. It can be. It can be filtering through some trees, but they need some sun to sure. bloom anyway. Yeah, mm -hmm. and the more sun you give them, the more flowers you'll get. For yes. sure. Okay, yeah. Ellen, it looks like you have your hand up. Do you want to unmute yourself and ask a question? Thank you. I would like to ask a question, but I noticed that there are other people in the line that have um, <laughs> written questions. I don't want to jump ahead. Oh, of no anything. worries. Go ahead. Go ahead. We'll get um, there. So I have a lace cap hydrangea that's actually on the west side of my house and gets heavy afternoon sun. So I'll just say that ahead of time. It's been in the ground for about 15 years, has bloomed fabulously it's my was my favorite plant two years ago i noticed that some of the leaves were kind of looking shrunken and grayish brown and withered and then last year really i would say most of the plant ended up like that and mm -hmm. so my question is is it too late to save it or do i have to just pull it out of the ground and throw and you know get rid of it or burn it up or whatever yeah, and one of the things to consider is the age of the plant. That was part of, because sometimes plants just outgrow their lifespan. Okay, mm -hmm. that could be one of your issues because you said it's been about fifteen years. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. It does, really, it does sound like it's succumbed to one of the viruses. Um, and um, you know, I, I guess I would really study the plant and see if it's pervasive across the entire plant. And sadly, it might be time to say goodbye to it. Um, if not, you could um, try to open it up and, in, and by pruning it to encourage the airflow to reduce the, the mildew or virus that's, that's there. Um, be sure to pick up any of the leaf litter that's around it that could contain the whatever disease it has and destroy that um, just to give it maybe one more chance. And sometimes I know that um, macrophylla can tolerate, you might, you will lose a bloom cycle, but they can tolerate a really pretty severe uh, like renovation style pruning. You might try that before you start that with a really severe pruning. Mm -hmm. And if I did that, if I decided to go that route, which I'm very tempted to do, could I do that now? Um, it is a macrophylla. Well, if it's, is it not blooming for you any longer at, in the state that it's in now? It bloomed last year, but the flowers, there were some flowers that were normal and then others looked just not, you know, like they were trying their best, but it wasn't going to happen very not well. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. So the problem with being pruned anytime, it's just that you prune the blooms off now. Mm -hmm. um, but if it's not blooming anyway, then 
You had, had you, you, been, for, had you been fertilizing it? No, I have never fertilized it. Well, that may be also an issue because it may have used up all the nutrients in the soil. Okay. <laughs> well, I do mulch heavily every year. Oh, yeah, well, that's good. Mm -hmm. That's good. Um, yeah, well, I'm, happy, I'm happy to, you know, to avoid, I'm happy to give up the flowers this year if I can save the plants. So, right. Uh, yeah, I would recommend a, a good pruning and make sure you're you're opening it up, not just cutting it down, but also opening up to getting rid of some of the interior um, right. branches. Yeah, to increase the airflow, mulch it well, um, get your soil tested. But give it some nitrogen. Your soil, the soil test is not really going to give you an indication of whether it needs nitrogen, and it, it sounds like it may. Mm -hmm. um, okay. And keep it well watered and see how it does. And, and if it doesn't show any recovery, then I would take it out. Thank you so much. I really appreciate your time. Sure. Thanks for the question. Okay. So Marilyn says, I've never fertilized a hydrangea that wasn't planted in a pot. In the ground, I just mulch them with compost, leaf mold, bark chips. Why do you need to fertilize them in the ground if they seem to be growing well? She asks. Yeah, you don't. If they're doing no. well. Yeah, she's, really also give, she's also giving it nutrients by using that leaf mulch. That's right. Yeah. So you're adding nitrogen when you do a good uh, mm -hmm. leaf mulch on it. So you're naturally fertilizing, which is fabulous. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. And your point, Marilyn, that you feel like we fertilize too much and it ends up causing algal blooms in the waterways. Yeah, that's for sure a thing. Absolutely. But if your plant's growing yeah. just fine, there's no reason to give it any more. It already has everything it needs. Yep. They they love uh, hydrangea, love compost, uh, which they is sure wonderful do. fertilizer. Excellent. Okay. Kate has an interesting question, and I'm wondering if you've heard anything like this. She said she had limelight hydrangeas pruned back last winter because they got huge. And when they came out the following summer, the blossom heads were almost grotesquely huge, just about twice the normal size. She wants to know why. And she also says that she didn't do any pruning this year. So will they go back to their normal size? Oh, uh, we want to hear. Or we want to report back. <laughs> yeah, honestly, that's really interesting. I don't really Kate. know. I mean, I can, ex I, you know, pruning stimulates growth. <laughs> so it may be that, that you pruned it at the appropriate time to stimulate that, that growth that generated the bloom. I, I expect that if you didn't prune, it's not going to have those gigantic blooms. but. I want to hear. <laughs> I want to hear. <laughs> no kidding. So Rachel's asking, can you propagate any time, spring or winter? Um, it's better to do it in spring when the plant's actively growing. It's not growing in winter, so it doesn't uh, doesn't. You want you want that high growth time. Yeah. Okay. Like we talked about, you want to make sure the cuttings that you take are ready to, are ready to be propagated. And in the winter, they're somewhat dormant. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the juices are flowing down to the root versus right. you want them flowing out to the leaves. Mm -hmm. Okay. Carolyn's asking, how large is large enough to plant in the ground? Uh, it, 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 that, that, that depends. I think it depends on where you're putting it and what kind of protection it has. So look, I happen to be on this picture, that plant to the you know the bottom there. In my yard, if I'm putting it in the backyard where it's not going to get deer pressure, um, and I don't have large dogs running over it, I've got small dog, um, I could put that in the ground. I'd be ready to put that in the ground. So about that size. But um, if you if it's going in an area where you've got an animal that's potentially going to run through there or you've got deer or and or rabbits i have terrible rabbit problems um you know you want then in that case you want the plant to get large enough to be able to defend itself a little bit for sure another consideration is that smaller plants establish themselves quicker than larger plants so you mm -hmm. won't have to be watering them in as long but again like you said tony if you've got an animal maybe you do need a big one so it can handle anything that comes yeah. in, the, in the yeah area. that's a really good good point about the the um smaller plants tend to establish better than large plants right. we're all tempted to buy the biggest one we can find but it's better to go in the other direction that's true in many cases Definitely. Okay. So Tracy is asking, what do we do when the plant has circospora leaf spot disease? Yeah. And I mean, there um, is that pervasive? It's, it can be pervasive. So, you know, the, the practices you want to first try to contain it 
without chemicals. So you want to open it up, get the airflow, get, destroy any any affected leaves. Um, but then you may have to seek out a, a a fungicide that you can put on it. Um, and fortunately, we don't. It's not really common. Uh, it's not. Uh, at least I've not experienced this um, with a lot of hydrangea. So. That's the good news, but the bad news is once you have it, it can be it can be difficult to get rid of. But the important thing is the airflow, keeping moisture off of the leaves, and destroying any leaves that are showing it, mm-hmm. getting them out of your garden completely. Sure. And you want to make sure that it's not near another plant that it would pass the infection along. Mm-hmm. Right. Well, then I'll um, while while people are thinking about the other questions, yeah. Blake, I'll just mention that we are NC State Extension Master Gardener volunteers from Wake County. And Master Gardeners are available to answer questions um, Monday through Friday from 9 to 12 and 1 to 4. You can call us. You can come visit us at 4001 Caria Drive, which is off of Pool Road in Raleigh. You can email us at mgardener at wakegov.com. And then we have a website, gardening at ces.ncsu.edu. And I mentioned that it was, um, I, I warned people about using uh, stock photos and making their plant the selection decisions based on stock photos. Sometimes those photos are from Cape Cod or someplace like that where the the um, conditions are so different than we have. Um, one, in addition to physically going to the Arboretum and seeing the specimens there at the Arboretum, the Arboretum also has pictures of plants in their, their I don't remember what it's called, their toolkit, but also yeah. at gardening.ces.ncsu.com. EDU, we have a plant toolbox, mm-hmm. and you can do a search on the different um, species there, and there are pictures available, and also we'll give you the details on um, how to plant and what the zones are, what conditions it likes, and there's a lot of detail in, that, those, in the plant toolbox. I encourage you to visit that. And I think you're talking about on the JCRA website, the one that's called Showtimes. Showtimes, perhaps. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And also remember that these are only for uh, these that we only answer questions for uh, home gardeners. We don't do anything for commercial gardening. Right. But we are physically sitting there ready to take questions and uh, and welcome them. So absolutely. Okay. well, I think that is all the time we have for today. So thank you, Tony and Noel, for giving this wonderful presentation. It It was was our pleasure. And thank you so much for inviting us. Yeah, I have one question, please. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry, it's Mel. Um, I have a climbing hydrangea, which tends to go wild. I send the runners back up the trellis, but it goes out into the yard. Do you have any suggestions from containing it? I know they're slow growing. Yeah, they are slow growing. I have one, this one here. Um, so there's a trellis hiding underneath that plant there. Um, and you can all even see over there on the right, uh, down at the bottom, there's a bit of bloom remains. It bloomed this year for the, the first time in five years. Yes, they um, are slow growing. Yeah, they're slow. Um, I prune it a little bit just to cut it back and keep it. Um, but I don't know of any other way the, other than what you said. You kind of you know, turn it back onto its trellis and and uh, give it a little pruning. In time I to usually time. share them. Yes, and they great. Remember that they propagate well, so it's a yes. good opportunity to to yep. uh, to propagate when you do that. They basically, pretty. propagate themselves. Yes, mm-hmm. yes, and this one, um, um, because of the way it grows, you can do that same kind. Of, well, I don't remember what the term is now, but I should know it. Um, when it touches the ground, you can you can root you can root it there. Put a right. something on it where it's touching the ground. Yes. And you can read it right there in the spot and then cut it and, and dig it up once it's established. Mm-hmm. In yeah. my experience, it roots itself when it runs along the ground. Yeah, mm-hmm. It'll start to take over. Yeah. I, I, unlike some climb, I've got a, a, a plant that they call a climbing hydrangea. It's not actually hydrangea. They false hydrangea that climbs up a tree. I The, the pediolaris does not, in my experience, at least climb up. It tends to climb up and then uh, weep down. Um, so it, it does mean that it touches the ground and wants to establish and take off from there. So you have to keep an eye on it. 
Great, okay. thanks. Uh-huh. Okay. So again, thank you to Tony and Noel for doing this for us. And thank you everybody for joining us for this presentation. We're going to be doing another Master Gardener talk at the end of February on the 27th. We're going to have Rich Wojnix in. He's going to be talking about preparing your gardens for the spring. So that will be very timely and informative. And I hope you all will join us for that. Well, thank you. Like I said, thank you again for having us. It's been our pleasure. Yes, thank you so much. Great. All right. Thank you, everybody. Y'all take care. You do the same. Nice to meet you, Blake. You too. Bye-bye. Bye.